Welcome to the Dance NYC 2022 Symposium, Life Cycles, Livelihoods, Legacies. We will be with you shortly. Today's schedule. This morning, we gathered for a welcome and wake up, 10 o'clock sessions, and an 11.30 dance break presented by Kumbay Center for African and Diaspora Dance. We will now begin our 12 o'clock early afternoon sessions, followed by a nourishing lunch at 1.30. At this time, you may also explore our exhibitor hall, where we will host the virtual expo showcase. At 2.30, we will begin our late afternoon sessions, followed by a 4.15 community daily debrief, where all attendees are encouraged to attend and discuss the day's activities. At 5 o'clock, head over to our exhibitor hall again to explore our second virtual expo showcase of the day. And at 6 o'clock, we will present our keynote presentation. Accessibility. ASL interpretation and live captioning will be provided for today's session. A stream to text link will be posted in the chat and participation guide for access to the live transcription. Stay connected with us by posting your takeaways on social media using the hashtags DanceSimp, DanceNYC 2022, and DanceSimp 2022. On Instagram at dance.nyc, on Twitter at dance.nyc, and on Facebook at dance slash nyc. Community Guidelines Based on Dance NYC's values of justice, equity, and inclusion, we agree to share our opinions, challenge perspectives, and engage or debate respectfully, and acknowledge and course correct if harm is caused. Honor everyone's personhood and humanity. Not tolerate speech that is disparaging, abusive, violent, or that is intended to defame someone's character publicly. Some features not to miss. Build your agenda of sessions. Connect with other attendees. Join community conversations. Visit the exhibitor hall. Don't forget to check out the 2022 Symposium Digital Program Book. We are happy to be in community with you. Thanks for joining. Hello everyone, my name is Ariel Herrera. I am the manager for research and advocacy at Dance NYC. My pronouns are he, him, his. I live in Muncie, Lenape land, now called West Village in Manhattan. I am a non-disabled cisgender male, Asian American and Filipino descent. I have short dark hair and wear black eyeglasses. I'm currently wearing a um, gray, long sleeve shirt with two pockets and behind me is a white wall. Thank you all for joining us for the digital 2022 Dance NYC Symposium. As a gentle reminder, we are at the mercy of technology. So we ask for your patience ahead of time. Should there be delays, sound issues and other annoyances that may occur during our time together. So before we begin, I have a couple of announcements. First, we have ASL interpreters from Sign Nexus and closed captioning services provided by the Viscardi Center available throughout the session. Also, a stream to text link is available and posted in the chat for further reference. You will find speaker information in the description below, as well as under the speakers module on the left side of your Whova web app or in the um, on the menu of your um, Whova mobile app. This information is also available on our website. Second, please feel free to post comments you want to share with the community in the chat section to the right 
side of this event room. Dan's NYC moderators are there to interact with you. Um, there will be a designated Q&A session after the panel presentation. So feel, please feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A module to be sent along to the panel. If you cannot access the chat room, please call our helpline at 212-966-4454 for technical support or to propose questions or comments. After our session ends, there will be a session follow-up in the community section of Whova where you can continue the conversation. Lastly, help us amplify these conversations. Please repost, tag us, and share your takeaways on Twitter at DanceNYC, Instagram at dance.nyc or Facebook dance NYC, uh, sorry, dance slash NYC using the hashtag dance SYMP or dance simp. And now we begin our session, growing a dance business to scale. We are delighted to have with us a panel of arts organization business leaders who will share with us lessons learned and best practices in business strategies, legal tools, administrative frameworks for growing organizations from single scrappy operations into mature structured entities. This session is curated with X. Please welcome our moderator, founder and managing attorney of the cloud law firm PLLC, Ashley and Cloud. Welcome Ashley. Hello, sorry about that delay. Um, my name is Ashley Cloud. My pronouns are she, her. I am on the Lenape and Canarsie land. And I am from Creole and Cajun descent. I am currently wearing a turquoise and blue dress and gold dangly earrings. And I have a black Afro. And behind me is my, basically my home office with my French doors and my huge mirror behind me. Thank you all so much. I will now hand it off to Violeta Galagarza. Hi everyone, my name is Violeta Galagarza, she, her, from NYC, I'm Puerto Rican, born in New York. I have a nonprofit organization called Keep Rising to the Top and we're based in Spanish Harlem. Thank you, Violeta. We will now hand it over to Lavesh Pritmani. Hello, everyone. My name is Lavesh Pritmani. Thank you so much to the Dance NYC team for having me. Um, my gender pronouns are he, him, and identify as an Indian American. I am calling in from Raleigh, North Carolina on indigenous Lumbee land. And uh, my organization is Learn Pangra, it's the name of my company. Um, for accessibility, I'm wearing a plaid white shirt, <clears throat> plaid design with a pocket, and I am in my home office on a black chair with a white background. Thank you, Lavesh. We're gonna hand it over to Jeremy McQueen. Welcome, Jeremy. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeremy McQueen. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm currently on the land of Munsee Lenape, and I am a non-disabled Black man wearing a Black sweater with large white stars all over, um, with my dreadlocks twisted into a high bun. Um, and I am the founding artistic director and choreographer of the New York City-based ballet collective, The Black Iris Project. We specifically bring uh, black, black ballet dancers and Black creative artists together to create original classical and contemporary ballets that are rooted in Black history or the Black experience. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. I'm, I, for one, am very honored and excited to be here to have this conversation with you about growing and scaling your dance business. Um, just a little bit more about my background. I am a graduate of Howard University School of Law and School of Business. 
and I recently launched my own law firm. And one thing that I can tell you is with all the schooling that I've done, there is nothing that can prepare you for starting your own business. Um, it doesn't matter how many people you talk to, how many books you read, it really gets down to actually facing your fears and doing it and just starting it. And so the first question that I wanted to pose to the panel is just share your experience on what inspired you to not only have this passion for dance, but also deciding to turn it into a business. And I'll, I'll let anyone who's the most excited go first. I can jump in. Um, this is Jeremy speaking. And I was uh, about eight years old when my mother took me to go see the national tour of the Broadway musical, The Phantom of the Opera um, in San Diego, California, where I'm from. And we sat on the last row of the balcony of this huge like 3000 seat theater so high up that my mother could rent binoculars. And we rented those binoculars and I sat with them practically glued to my face the entire time as I sat on the edge of my seat, just fully enamored by the entire experience from the plush red curtains to the seats that we sat in, the lighting, seeing the orchestra and the orchestra pit, the entire experience transformed my life in ways that I never imagined that it ever would. Um, that singular experience of seeing live theater and dance um, gave me inspiration to want to find a way to create my own narratives and tell my own stories. Um, so I eventually, you know, knew that I wanted to move to New York and I wanted to be on Broadway and I wanted to dance at different ballet companies. And I really wanted to be able to not only tell dynamic stories, but be able to eventually bring uh, very personal or stories that connect with my community, things that I did not see growing up in particularly the ballet world. Um, so as a student at the Ailey School at the Ailey Fordham BFA program, I can connect so much with what Ashley said about you know, uh, our educations did not support, you know, did not prepare us for entrepreneurship or for what it really means to start a business. I knew nothing about um, grant writing, fundraising, anything like that. Luckily, my I come from a family of entrepreneurs. However, um, trying to figure out how to even build or scale any type of dance organization in the vast metropolis that is New York City has been incredibly difficult, but, um, you know, when there's lack of opportunities for specifically Black choreographers in the ballet world, um, especially given opportunities to grow and to really find their voice and harness their talent, um, and I was just frustrated with, with waiting for others to give me a seat at the table or give me an opportunity, and I decided, you know what, if I, if I want to grow, I'm going to have to figure it out myself, whether it be reading books or connecting with mentors or asking whoever I can for help. But um, my love and passion for storytelling and, and wanting to specifically share narratives that are so uh, dear to me and are rooted so deeply in, in who I am and my culture um, has been the driving force beyond all of the challenges that I face. Um. I didn't get to introduce blonde hair, Violeta Galagasa, uh, she, her, NYC, background, beige wall with awards behind me, loop earrings, um, and a chain that represents KR3T's dance company. Um, basically, I came from the urban world with hustle when it was the hustle time and I was trained by and and danced with my siblings hustle and started off in the schools and auditioned for Alvinelli as a young ballet dancer and trained ballet modern jazz African became great at it unfortunately after I graduated got a four-year scholarship with Alvinelli I received another four years and went to junior high school performing arts. And from there, as I was graduating, unfortunately, I became a young mom and that stopped me from continuing from going to Alvinelli. You become thicker, bigger. At that time, it wasn't acceptable. You had to be a certain weight size uh, when it came to ballet. And so I took it upon myself and I said, I can't 
just let this go. This is all I know. The more I was so passionate and I saw that I had an escape of something that I had a platform to be and take control of. And so I was challenged through a director of a place where I started rehearsing with dancers in my community. And he challenged me to do a Broadway show. Through that Broadway show, there was never internet, no YouTube, no connection, so what, or family that of any experience of that world. And so I took the challenge. He said, either you do that, a Broadway show, or join this ballet company. And I said, you know what? I'm going to just challenge myself and just go with it. And I did it. Within three months, I was able to really understand being under pressure, what I can create under that. And I was able to create in three months from 12 dancers to 60 dancers, actually having to being the host, the choreographer of nine choreographies, costumes. I was 17 years old and um, DJ edits. And from there on, that's when I started recognizing that I can acknowledge more from what technology wasn't existed before of who I am now, which is 32 years with this organization of challenging other dancers and preparing them for the industry as well. So that's my way and, and learning how to fundraise. At that time, it was cake sales <laughs> from the beginning before sponsors ever existed. So um, it was a, a bit challenging, but there was the process of growth. And what reminded me not to give up, it was my passion. Why did I ever start something that I loved, something that I was able to recognize uh, easily and, and connect with? Thank you so much, Violetta, for that insight. And my apologies for totally missing you. Um, that was not intentional at all. Um, Lavesh, let's hear from you. What's your inspiration for starting your business? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, this is Lavesh with money. Um, so for me, I guess kind of giving the background of how I started in dance and how it um, became part of uh, my business that I have today. Um, you know, growing up, it was, I was actually very adverse to dance. It wasn't something that I was very much interested in and um, it wasn't a passion at all uh, until I got to about 16, 17. Um, growing up in uh, in Indian American culture, one of the things that we do to celebrate any type of event is a particular dance form known as Bhangra. It's a very high energy folk dance from uh, the northern region of India and Pakistan called Punjab. <clears throat> and it's a celebratory dance. It actually came from farmers who would celebrate their harvest. And so because it's a mood of celebration, of joy, uh, it's made its way into any type of celebration. So growing up, you had this exposure to seeing, um, you know, many people dance at parties and events, uh, but it wasn't something that I was really into. Uh, around 16 and 17, I really felt this, um, you know, kind of drive internally to connect back to my culture. I started meeting, um, you know, more Indian Americans in high school. And, uh, you know, we kind of had this commonality that, hey, we came from the same background. We maybe didn't grow up with each other. But when you get to a bigger school, you see more people that have some of that thing you can connect with. And so part of that connection, kind of reconnection back with the culture was, hey, we, we all grew up with this dance bhangra. We've never really danced it formally. How cool would it be if we started doing this together? Um, and so that's where my dance journey sort of started at, at around that age. Um, and then fortunately at the university level, Bhangra had become really popular from a competitive standpoint. So now you're a junior, senior, you're excited about, you know, hopefully going to college and getting be on a, on a competitive team. So it's driving you to continue putting and investing time into learning, you know, this, this art form that we all loved. And um, long story short, it ended up being a, uh, start for me where I got really passionate about it. Um, not only did I do it competitively in, at university level, but I also uh, started an academy or joined into an academy that just started. Um, and I started teaching Bhangra as well from my few years of watching DVDs and trying to learn on my own. There was no YouTube back at that time. Um, so, you know, that, that journey lasted for about 10 years where you know, I competed for some time, then I started coaching teams after I left university, having them compete. Um, and so I had an academy for a decade. Uh, and that was kind of the first 
business, right, that I started. But what I have today morphed from uh, more a necessity for me, which was I worked in the corporate world and um, the corporate world told me, hey, you need to move from North Carolina to New York for your job. Okay, great. I'm not complaining. Um, but, you know, I, that meant I'm going to have to give up my academy. So that's when I thought about how can I continue keeping up this dance I'm so passionate about, um, but not having a physical location to have to be, you know, doing it in. And that's where I thought about digitizing the learning of Bhangra dance because nothing like that existed. And my own experience taught me I had to piece together things from DVDs, right? So I utilized uh, YouTube and created an app, launched uh, an app for iOS and Android devices that basically systematically created a learning platform for, for this particular folk dance um, and then expanded into many other uh, things like certifying instructors, doing workshops, uh, corporate workshops, et cetera. I think the two things that really drove me to get to that decision were one, my passion that I had built up over these years and seeing how much it meant to me and it allowed me the creative freedom. Um, two was my coach who really introduced me to the beauty of folk bhangra. I learned what I could on my own, but then I was very fortunate that he had moved from India and happened to be, ended up in North Carolina, very close by. And just when I saw the the raw emotion and the, uh, you know, the whole background, the history of this dance that came together, um, that was something I wanted to spread to the rest of the world because it impacted my life in, in so many different ways. Um, and then the third thing was uh, entrepreneurship. Um, like, like uh, I know Ashley and Jeremy were mentioning, it's not something that's typically taught in, you know, at, at a, at, in an educational setting. Um, I was fortunate I had a little bit of a different background in that my family, um, you know, my parents owned their own business. My extended family had their own businesses, whether it was retail, whether it was wholesale, not, nothing fancy, nothing uh, cutting edge, but, you know, they had their own businesses. And so for me, it was almost like a I felt like a birthright that I wanted to do something, right? And it was kind of like driving me to have my own business. So that's how I, I put the dance and the passion that I had for it and the, you know, feeling of entrepreneurship together and launched Learn From Hub. That's really awesome. Um, I'm hearing a lot of commonalities between all of us, really. One, our passion stems from our own identity and our own background and, and the experiences that we've all had. And another, especially what Violetta said, uh, really what everyone said is you saw a need, it wasn't being met, and you decided you were going to take up the responsibility to make something happen and do something that hadn't been done before. So I commend you all for that. Um, I wanted to ask, um, <laughs> When you have an idea, it's one thing to have ideas. We all have ideas all the time. But how, what, was, what was your journey like to turn your idea of your business into reality? What was the day-to-day -day like? What were the steps that you took to take your business from an idea into an actual entity? And I'll, I'll um, hand this over to Violetta. <laughs> um. The question again, I'm sorry. The what what were the steps that you took to turn your business from idea into inception? When I was challenged that day um, with my director, a director that was at LaGuardia Corsi House. And I did not know because again, it was just something I did for fun, an escape, a place to be at. But then I saw there was a necessity in my community. At that time, it was the 90s pandemic, so much stuff going on, but that was everybody's escape goal. And I knew I had now more a responsibility. What can I do to gain more stability to keep this going? Because I didn't know it was going to be a company. I just, a crew at that time, we're just a dance crew and I'm just a dancer. I didn't call myself a choreographer, a director, and, but I started seeing that even community leaders was acknowledging who we was and what we was doing for our community, you know, events and festivals. And I said, wow, this is bigger than what I thought. This is a platform where I can use and access to even help others get into. And, I, and whatever knowledge that I was able to receive, um, I would attend workshops 
uh, what it was to become a 501c3. I didn't even understand what that was. I was 17 when I started my company, so you can imagine. Um, and so it, the language and <laughs> the business part wasn't really in my thoughts. It was much more um, just, again, the, being passionate and being safe, a safe haven, a place for all of us to go. But as I was going, the information that people were giving me and the, the community leaders in, our, in, New, in Spanish Harlem was guided, they guided me to that, the steps, the process. And still to this day, you have a lot to learn because the rules change. Uh, so that's what helped me understand that, oh, I have a more bigger responsibility, but now the word is around of who I am and what I'm doing. Now I have access to looking into gaining that resources from other places. It wasn't easy, but I had continued as long as we had the foundation of space and that's where I began and that's where it all, uh, I was able to just have one foundation of dancers that would want to learn how to dance, people that wanted to be trained more in the business world and travel professionally, and then experience in knowing not only to being a dancer, but being responsible for being a leader. Um, how can we get funding? And moving on to the growth of that, which is not an easy route, but it was something that I had to do. I had to be responsible in my community. It's more socialism of everything that's going on. I, ha I thought I had to take that responsibility and stop in the, the celebrity life and be in my community. So you decided to have, you mentioned that you started a 501c3. Can you explain what that is and why you decided to do that? Um, Congressman Charles Durango had their chief of staff and they saw for the past at that time, like for three years, um, all the stuff that I was doing for the community, free events, free shows and looking for space. And um, so she recommended me, uh, why don't you get incorporated? And I did not know what that was. And she said, well, the, go in, the government has money funding for organizations like you, minority, women, mother, um, in the arts that you can apply for, I still didn't really understand. So um, it actually helps us to find grants um, or sponsorship where we have a 501c3 tax exempt, anyone that gives us funding, support, whether funding in, in, um, in funds or product, it would be a tax write-off for individuals that wanted to support us then just being for-profit and it's the money they're giving and investing wasn't getting nothing back. So I took the uh, challenge of that. I did went on a workshop and throughout that, I still didn't know, <laughs> understand, but I got incorporated within a month. I expedited within that month just to have it, whatever they told me what I had to do. And I put that to the side and just continued in doing yearly events. So it just, I just felt that I was more legit and uh, legal and protected at that time. This is good, I have a team. I didn't know you get board members involved and they can be the overview to see and help and guide you, which that was another Thing that I had to learn as well, having board members with your organization, which is not so easy. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, it sounds like it was, it was, it's been a journey, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, well, let's hear from uh, Jeremy and, and Lavesh. What, what was your experience from idea to inception of your, of your business? This is Jeremy here. Um, yeah, so my idea, I think, uh, was really kind of in development for, for many, many years. I studied in a number of different ballet schools and was always very active in, in just my education and training and trying to become the strongest 
uh, student and professional dancer that I could. And I, I tried to learn as much as I could through observation, always knowing that eventually I did want to start something of my own. I didn't know exactly what that would be, but I knew that being able to share my own voice and being able to help create a pathway for other young people like me to have increased visibility was always a, a huge priority. So I started choreographing professionally in 2008 when I graduated from college. And I honestly, you know, kind of reached out to anyone that would give me an opportunity to create, whether it be, you know, local dance studios or dance festivals around the city, um, just so that I could continue to kind of harness my artistic voice. Um, I can firmly say that the voice that I had at 22 is certainly not the same voice I had at 30, and especially not now at 35. And, and one of my mentors had said, you know, good things take time. And I, I trusted her. I didn't completely understand it, but I, I did a lot of writing um, just to kind of figure out who I am and what makes me unique and all of these experiences that I've had both as a Black man in the worlds of professional theater and dance. Um, how can I utilize those, um, those experiences to help benefit me and to help me um, find my own place or my own piece of uh, the cake here in this New York City metropolis. So, um, but in 2015, I was working for American Valley Theater teaching in their education and outreach department where I went into a number of different public school settings where I was teaching ballet primarily to black and brown youth. And um, I immediately, you know, for years, having had taught for a number of different institutions, I, I knew that there were going to be some challenges. Um, Black and brown youth often uh, feel as though ballet does not resonate with them. And so I had to find really creative strategies to be able to engage them on a deeper level. Um, ballet for me has always provided so much discipline and focus. There's a lot of... Um, issues with ballet um, and with it being, you know, so centered in, in white supremacy and the structure of, of mindset of body type and skin complexion and all of those things. So I had to um, essentially be the change within myself and show these dancers that, you know, there's still so much beauty in ballet and there's still ways that you can love your body and love your skin complexion and, and still explore this art form, which helps teach you a foreign language, which um, allows you to, to do a lot of different things. So I saw the positives and the negatives in ballet, um, but I also found creative strategy, strategies from playing Beyonce music in class to whatever it took to kind of keep them engaged. And in that process, there was a light bulb that kind of went off was that was like, you know what, if, 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 why can't I start this? No matter how small it may be, you know, why can't it start with just one ballet that I create um, that could potentially, you know, launch us to a bigger uh, platform? And the first ballet that we created officially as the Black Irish Project was the story of Nelson Mandela's life. It was always my goal to tell stories that typically don't get shared through classical ballet to create that increased visibility and connectivity to expand audiences and to expand the inspiration of of um, what you can do through art, um, not even just ballet. And so um, we created a, a 25 minute ballet about Nelson Mandela's life with an original score created primarily by an entire team of, of black creatives. And um, very quickly, I realized that what we were doing was extremely unique. Um, I, I knew that it was unique and special to me, but um, we eventually, you know, very quickly got the Kennedy Center heard about our project and heard about our ballet and we were invited to the Kennedy Center before we had even gone public with what this thing is that we were creating. So um, for me, it's just been lots of writing, lots of research, a lot of talking to people and talking to myself to really figure out who I am and, and how can I impart, you know, um, some of my experience and knowledge and challenges to help inspire and help to move culture and to help move the dance industry forward. And that's it for me. That's awesome, Jeremy. We'll hand it over to Lavesh. Sure, thank you. Uh, this is Lavesh here. Um, so, yeah, I think the first thing to start uh, the any business, and in, in particular for me for Learn Pangra, is um, when I look at it, is I want to make sure I have uh, a plan written out. And whether you handwrite it, whether you use you know, your PC, however, but um, just jot down everything that if you were trying to start something, um, you know, what would you need? And I used to do as simple as put a 
you know, a header in say marketing, finance, right? Uh, technology, I'd break it down and then everything I just word dump within those categories. Um, and so taking the time to start that way, brainstorming, um, putting everything that is in your mind, if you are starting this completely by yourself onto paper, uh, is kind of the first step that that I, you know, I take um, whenever I'm trying to start a new project or business. Um, and then the second step for me is bringing in people who I trust, who I think are really good at what they do, and having them uh, look at what I've put together and expanding upon that. Right. Um, that's that's been a huge help for me. And so to give you an idea, when I started Learn Bangra, the way we started this was uh, our whole brand was centered around creating these tutorials of teaching the stance form, right? And um, video tutorials. And so uh, I was very fortunate that my one of my family members, my cousin, uh, was a videographer in LA and he had tremendous experience with uh, just doing all types of video projects. So the first thing I did is I put my thoughts and then I called my cousin and I said, what do you think about me putting it together this, this and this way? And how do you think we would get this whole thing done? What would be required from equipment, cost, et cetera, standpoint, right? And somebody with that expertise was able to probably save me uh, a lifetime of me trying to figure it out on my own, right? Um, same thing with finance, you know, talking to somebody that you know who is really good with numbers and, um, you know, has experience with, with running a financial side of the business, same with marketing. Um, and so I think we all are fortunate enough, hopefully, that we have some people that we trust or some network, leverage that network and, and have them kind of look over your project and, and where you're thinking. And then at least you have a good direction as to where to start. Now, after you've started, I think there's a lot you're going to learn along the way. And no matter what you start, no matter how many times you started something, you'll probably still learn something new for sure, right? Um, that's just the way any any business journey or organization journey, I think, works. Uh, but I think setting yourself up for success is, for me at least personally, has been organizing myself that way and then bringing in uh, people that I think can help me think differently and challenge also what I've put together um, so that, you know, we, you maximize the chance of, of succeeding in what you want to do. Just to chime back in, this is Jeremy on, on what Lavesh said. Um, you know, definitely being open to failure, I think, is is one of the biggest takeaways for me um, going into this, knowing that there's so much to learn in the process and just really being open to um, understanding. I tell my partner, I fail at something every day. And that's OK, because if you're not failing at something, you're not learning, you're not growing, you're not trying. And so um, that that was definitely something that resonates with me still today, just continuing to figure it out, because I really don't have all of the answers, you know, to be selected to be on this panel. I'm in, incredibly humbled and I kind of chuckled at it. But but um, but I do value, you know, being able to share my story and being able to share um, a part of, of what helps uh, build an infrastructure. But um, and to also to go back to what Violetta said, um, fiscal sponsorship was one of the first steps for me as well. Um, finding an organization that I could work with um, that would enable me to be able to receive support with collecting donations and making those donations tax deductible um, and then being able to then apply for grants. That was a huge step. Um, and, and trying to figure out how to navigate, how to do this all. Um, fiscal sponsors were, were really in, imperative to my growth, um, to just helping me understand how this system often works. This is Ashley here. Thank you all so much for your insight. I'm just gonna go around and ask each one of you what kind of business entity you have, I think. Um, Violetta, you have a 501c3. Yes, I have a 501c3, uh, keep rising to the top, KRTT's dance company. Okay. And, yeah. Yeah. I just, I'm just asking just like business entity wise, um, what kind of structure you have. So thank you for that, Violetta. Lavesh, and, and what do you have? Yeah, so I have a um, LLC and uh, in my specific state, you know, you can choose between a C Corp, S Corp. Um, so mine is set up as a C Corp. Uh, and currently with just one member. Um, now, 
reason I'm not a tax expert, but I can tell you that the benefit of doing it in certain ways versus the others are uh, how many people are part of your organization that would be key members sharing in profit, right, et cetera, versus potentially people that are going to work in your organization, but maybe, uh, you know, temporary or somebody you're issuing a W-9 to or whatever, right? Um, the benefit in doing it as an LLC, as an individual member is that for my taxes, right, is going to benefit me individually if I set it up as a single member, uh, you know, particular type of LLC. Um, so that's something you just have to consider as whatever your business is and whoever you have from a partner standpoint, you know, do you want to have multiple members as part of that LLC? Or is it something that you are just for now and in the near future are running yourself? And that could impact the tax benefit and, and the way you look at it, um, you know, from, from a long-term standpoint as well. But again, I would recommend, of course, talking to a professional and an expert about that. Um, that's just something that going into it as to why I did it the way I did it. Thank you, Labesh. Um, absolutely. You definitely want to consult with an attorney and with a CPA or some kind of accountant to, you know, let them know where your goals are and then you can decide on what kind of entity is best for you. And Jeremy, what kind of entity do you have? It sounds like you have a 501c3 also. No, we're fiscally sponsored. So we're not our own 501c3 yet. We um, we are not a full-time organization, so we are still seasonal. It started out as a seasonal collaborative, primarily working in the summer. Um, but now we've moved towards um, various different times of the year based on the uh, the projects and the interests from our community. So, um, but fiscal sponsorship has been really beneficial for me. I'm, I'm fiscal sponsored through the Foundation for Independent Artists, Inc. And they help with, with so much. They do all of my payroll and um, bookkeeping, which really helps me in many ways to be able to focus on so many other administrative and creative tasks. Um, I am the primary person that does most of everything. So um, aside from the things that FIA helps with, which is multiple things, but um, I'm hoping that we can eventually get to a place where we can actually hire more staff and have more capacity to, to really grow into our own 501c3. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And this just gives us a great example of the diversity and the types of businesses that you can create. I think a lot of times we think you just have to have an LLC or you have to have a, a 501c3 or a corporation when Jeremy brings up a great example of where you don't have to choose any of those. You can choose something totally different. And then once you're ready to step into another phase of your business, you can do that on your own time and when you feel that you're comfortable and ready to do so. Now, I think all of you kind of hit on one thing that I'm actually uh, experiencing now with um, being like super productive and, you know, always on task and overachiever kind of mentality where I have this fear of failure in my business and it kind of stunts me from making decisions a lot of times because I'm like, I want to make the right decision. I want to make the right decision. But as Jeremy said, you're really not going to know until you try it out and see if it's the right decision. So I just wanted to ask you all, what are some challenges, whether it's like in mindset or like just paperwork or the day-to-day -day that you faced in, in, in your businesses and how have you overcome those? Uh, well, I'm great when it comes to coordinating and the experience I've went through to the challenge during when I was young. But the toughest part is when you're doing grants, finding a grant writer, keeping it on point with, you know, with your mission statement, um, uh, board members, and then finding space that you know that you're secure constantly as an as a dance company. Um, so it would become a lot, you know, to this day, because every year it's a new rules, whether it's taxes, grant submissions, you know, now is other sites that you have to reapply every year, the same thing or different, they change different positions, people that you establish relationship with, 
then the next year is someone else. So it's very difficult. And you really, like Jeremy would say, you got to keep, you know, on paper, on time with what's going on and who's involved, who you could connect with. Fiscal sponsorship is amazing because it's less of attic. And I'm, and I would love to even do stuff like that so that, you know, those other professionals that just deals with that department. So um, my, my challenge is, is that writing, I'm not a writer, but I'm a creator, I'm an artist, a choreographer. I know how to develop and prepare dances, amateurs to become professionals, developing big events, big shows, fundraisers, but when it comes to writing is the most difficult part in finding the right grant writer and submitting uh, a publicist, you know, things behind the scenes, costumes that we have to deal with, having a dance company um, and as a nonprofit. So those are my challenges. And then space uh, where you have to know that you're secure for rental and um, or limited space where there's, you know, not even a building that you can maybe invest in getting, you know, so that's the great challenge in my my part. But again, throughout the years, developing relationships or with organizations or past sponsors, future sponsorship, friends that are in different departments to help you and guide you and continue that. And working other projects in the side just to keep and being five steps ahead of what's going on. Ella, I'll jump in, this is Lavesh. Um, so I think the thing that I have struggled a little bit with um, is I have a natural quantity over quality approach. And um, for me, what that means is I try to boil the ocean to find, you know, whatever that next step is or the way my business should, you know, continue to go in direction or, you know, to get to XYZ person or XYZ opportunity. Um, and so what it ends up doing is it probably cost me a lot more time because I'm trying so many different things to see what will work versus maybe identifying what is the one or two best ways and investing my time into that. Right. And sometimes that comes from the unknown because you're starting something new and there's not a blueprint for how you're supposed to do that. Right. Um, and so that, that over time has been a challenge and I can't say it ever goes away because you know there's always something new that you want to go and continue to do and uh and get better at for your business um so for me that's that's always been a bit of a struggle is just that strategy of what's the best way to get to where i want to go um, and i think a few things i've learned over the years to help alleviate that is um you know even if you are starting something new and different maybe nobody's ever done it there still are a lot of examples of things that you can see that maybe another company that inspires you or another person that you've worked with has done and changing your thought process to think like that. You know, let's say you really want to meet a particular artist and this is the artist that, you know, lines in, uh, ties into exactly what you're doing. Instead of trying to reach out to 30 artists who maybe sort of have, have a connection, right? Figuring out how somebody else potentially was able to work with that artist, thinking about what that artist would value giving a proposal to them and putting your time into that proposal to them or using your network to reach out to them to connect to your dance, that might be a better way, right, than sending 30 DMs. And again, 30 DMs are great. It sometimes does work too. Um, but, you know, just, just as that way of kind of approaching, hey, somebody else had success in this. How can I apply that to, to my business or some other company had success in this? How can I apply that thought process, right, to, to my business? Um, that's something that's helped me. I think the other thing has been, uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, getting challenging your perspective. So this is the way I'm thinking of doing it. Somebody else who I value and uh, and trust, you know, how would they think about going about getting to this particular objective or goal? What would be their strategy? And then that kind of, you know, when you hear that from somebody else, that may influence and make you think about a different way of how to how to make things easier as well, too. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is. Uh, you know, what, what I do with, again, having that tendency to do quantity over quality, um, I've tried to take down and reduce that time by using more automated processes, right? So if you want to have email campaigns, instead of you physically going and sending all the emails yourself, you know, 
go get a CRM. It, it might cost more for sure, but if you really think that's a way of beneficially getting new people to scale your business or you know new um, new clients or whatever it may be you're looking after, invest in a CRM and and let you know let that pay back for you if you think that's the right strategy. Um, so I've tried to use technology and tools to kind of help with that. Uh, quantity approach as well. And, and that gives me more time to then start thinking more strategically about what I want to do as well. Thank you so much, Slavash. Can you explain what a CRM is? Great question. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so CRM, I think it stands technically for customer or client relationship management system or something like that. Basically, it's taking all of your um, data for contacts, customers, could be your network, could be whoever, and putting them into a system that then aggregates all of that data. Um, you know, HubSpot is, is one that's known for that as a company you may have heard of. There's, there's many of them, right? Um, you could probably even do it to your own degree in Excel to some degree, right? But just keeping a list of all your contacts and then having a way to not only manage their data, but extrapolate that information if you have a lot of that data and say, okay, I want to target everyone in New York City who is part of this network of customers or clients that I have, and I want to send them X, Y, Z, um, you know, maybe an email blast or telling them about the newest event you have coming out or your classes or whatever it may be. Um, and so at a basic level, a CRM allows you to take that data, manipulate that data, and then do something else with that data, right? Um, target and um, uh, you know, just continue to stay in front of in front of those people. Thank you so much for that. That's a great explanation. Very insightful. Um, Jeremy, could you chime in with any challenges that you face and how you overcame them? Yeah, there. This is Jeremy speaking, and yeah, there've been a couple um, challenges that, in particular, that kind of come to mind as very early on in the process. Um, the first being funding and the second being work-life balance. Um, for funding, you, it just, as we know, um, especially in the Valley world, there's a lot of tokenization and bias, um, even with just arts grants in general, um, often needing you know, ample reviews and press and years of experience and often to get you know, seed funding to even get going. Um, and so finding people that really believed in me and believed in this mission and believed that I could achieve um, the goals that I had set for myself was really, really hard. Um, but I cold called my face off. I cold emailed my face off to, you know, just share my heart and my passion and my mission with whoever would listen. Um, and through them, my, you know, the people that were receptive, I was able to uh, connect with other people and eventually find funding. And, you know, six years later, we have more people on board with us and supporting our organization and believing that this work is necessary. Um, by pure virtue of what we do, I am a disruptor, um, not only just within the ballet world, but also within just addressing social justice topics through art and trying to find a way to continue to move our country forward into a positive and new frontier. Um, but with that being said, um, feeling the weight of such a social responsibility um, to, 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 to do all of that and to try to find the funding as one single person, I often ran myself ragged, um, working you know, late nights, weekends, emailing, you know, writing uh, grant applications, whatever. Um, I, I struggled with work-life balance until the loss of my father in 2016. And that really took, gave me a moment to sit back and really think about how we should value and distribute time, especially with time with family and friends. And so um, being able to learn how to be cognizant about, you know, you don't need to write this email at one o'clock in the morning. It can wait till tomorrow and you can get adequate sleep and rest and enjoy your weekend. Um, that was something that I, I really struggled with for a, a long time and continue to battle with it sometimes um, when it feels like you just really you're really hopeful that something is going to turn around and that you're going to get that grant. You're going to get that funding to make this happen and to help inspire and motivate and, and move people for change. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And 
Um, I'm sorry about the loss of your father. I've also lost my father a few years ago. So I understand the how that can just totally shake your world and change the way you see a lot of things. So um, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, I wanted to ask you all about what, you know, what we're here talking about, how to grow a business to scale. I'm not going to lie to you. Seven years ago, I didn't know what's growing a business to scale meant. Like what, what is that? Like to scale? I don't know. Um, and so I was just going to ask you all, what does that look like for, for your business? What does it mean to scale a business? What does that mean? Like, you know, <laughs> what does it mean to scale a business and what does it look like in your business exactly? So, um, Jeremy, I'll hand this back over to you. Sure. Yeah. To scale. I think that means for me, I, I'm also still trying to figure that out because there hasn't necessarily been a model directly for me to draw from, especially with creating something that's so different than what's being done. Um, but for scale, for me, that that kind of means greater impact and structural growth. Um, for me, my work is all about community and accessibility um, so being able to reach audiences beyond just New York City, beyond, you know, the select cities that we've been able to tour to already, um, that, that in a sense means scale to me, but also um, being able to increase our, our funding, being able to hire more staff and collaborators to be able to create even more dynamic and impactful works. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that uh, the beauty of art gives us the ability to th think creatively through challenges, to be able to still make something truly dynamic with, what, with whatever resources we have. But I, I do hope and believe that we are going to continue to grow and that we're going to be able to impact even more families and communities around the country. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Lavesh, can you chime in with um, your insight and your perspective on what that means? Yeah, sure, absolutely. This is Lavesh. Um, so I don't know if this is the official definition of scaling your business, but uh, to me, it's it's kind of, I've always looked at it as um, how do you reach more people or more contacts um, that will convert over to whatever it is the objective is for, for your business, right? Whether that means followers, whether that means, um, you know, sales, gigs, whatever that may mean. Um, so how do you, how do you reach more people that uh, are impactful contacts or clients or whatever for your business? Um, and the reason I probably look at it that way is because my, my uh, particular business, Learn Fungra, is kind of predicated on technology. And so technology allows you to scale to reach more people, right? So that's kind of always been my, my blinders are there when I defined it uh, that way to myself. Um, I, think, I think the biggest thing is you need some type of strong foundation organization within your business to be able to reach your existing audience. And, you know, whether that means a website or whether that means your, uh, you know, Instagram page, whatever it may be, that is the main mechanism for how you're reaching out to, uh, you know, to your customers. Uh, I think you want to have a very solid foundation there that they can access, um, you know, the information that you're trying to provide to them and, and the overall goal of conversion. Uh, and then from there, to scale it means to add the blocks and pieces and new offerings and new things that helps expand that overall, um, you know, audience that you can, you can get in touch with. Um, and so, you know, I think if you look at it from uh, the aspect of a website, which is something that's like important to what we do, um, you know, we have a place where you can buy online classes, virtual classes, in-person classes. Um, and then what we've done is we've added a tab now for corporate wellness. And so for, uh, you know, organizations, companies who are looking to hire us for workshops and things like that, now we've created a special page just unique to that. And then um, brought in SEO techniques, search engine optimization, which are using the right types of keywords and, um, you know, images and, and text that basically if some organization was looking to say workshop for, you know, our employees, hopefully our page would then pop up to them and they would look at learning Bangra as an option for them, right? And so that's how we've scaled it. We've added this new offering. And then as we continue to grow and think about strategically what we want to do, 
we're adding those blocks upon that organized platform. And you don't have to do that on only a website. I just gave that as an example. You know, um, Instagram has evolved so much to where you can shop and buy directly uh, on there, which many of you may, I actually haven't done that yet. I need to figure out how that works, but um, you know, that, that's a, that's an offering that's on there. So you could, you could use any type of platform that works for your business. Um, you just want to make sure you have those pieces in the way to, to kind of grow your offerings so that you can reach that larger audience. Thank you, Lavish. Violetta, did you want to chime in about your organization and what that looks like for you to scale? Well, actually, I was so caught up in being the choreographer and being responsible of my organization in just training them to becoming amateurs, to becoming professionals from amateurs. But I actually understood that the most important thing is what's the next steps. Also, once you see the professionalism in them, teaching them to becoming teachers, then choreographers and having them be involved in your organization. And now you have the in-house and other opportunities to reach towards them in their specialties of what they're great at to bring them a part of the company as well. Um, cameramen, photography, videography. And now I was able to now step back and be more responsible as a leader and now be the advocate, the one that I can speak for and really represent for my choreographers, developing them, branding them, preparing for projects, videos, artists, famous artists or commercials or uh, festivals, big events that we have. Now I can appoint other people. So I was able to grow now, step back visually and see what I can create artistically direct and, and um, prepare for events and branding them individually, like we were speaking on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, every social media platform, as well as um, putting a story behind it because we're about socialism with my organization, not only training them to become professionals and being famous, but what can we do to impact our community? to keep going and getting the funding. So building and finding a place that's more stabilized as an organization, because that's what funders look for as well. You know, you can't just be all over the place. So in, in that growth of my experience was more being stepped back of my professionalism, um, passing the torch to the rest, where now I can do the leadership of getting the funds in getting the platform or important people, inviting funders, sponsors, you know, media, um, journalists, important people that want to know more about our community or our style of dance, because we teach all styles, hip hop, mambo, old school, new school, all, all styles. So how do we upscale from that? Well, passing the torch down to the rest, um, having our board members to be more involved, educating them, because a lot of them come with great interests and great, you know, what, what they see in supporting, but when they're not really involved and detached, they really don't understand our hunger, why we do this, and they can't relate much. So it's a great thing getting people more involved, being an advocate, stepping back from your position of what we do usually. And, we, and it's our baby, it's hard to let go. But finally, after 32 years, that helped me to now finally get even funding for myself because I would work three other jobs to help myself. And so now this is where it helps me in, in growing, in growing with my organization, upscaling, performing in platforms that we would never know. And because of now what we're dealing with Zoom, we're able to do other projects all over through Zoom as well. So that's a great, uh, way to upscale and develop these great relationships overseas. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Violetta. And that kind of takes me to my next question. With technology, especially in the age of COVID, and we're fingers crossed post-COVID, um, what are some tools and resources that have been vital to the success of your businesses? And I'll, I'll hand this over to Jeremy to start. Uh, yeah, I think this is Jeremy. I, I, I mentioned this earlier, but um, my fiscal sponsor, Foundation for Independent Artists, Inc. Um, they have been truly incredible. It's a 
a foundation through Pinnacle, um, who I know is very much involved with um, this weekend's symposium. But they, been, yes, they, they've taught me a lot about grant writing and funding and, and budgets and things of that nature. Um, so many things that, like I said before, I did not learn in a school environment. So that has been an incredible tool and asset for me. That's awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. Lavesh, did you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. Hey, this is Lavesh. Um, I think I would, if I had to pick one overall tool, I think Google has been really, really fantastic from just being able to start, organize, and put together a business. Um, and I'm not just talking about the search engine. I'm talking about G Suite. Um, the things that Google offers, when I look back at kind of like what I've started and, and where I've gotten to, and I promise you, I, I may know some buzzwords. I'm not technical. My 12-year-old niece is more technical than me and can tell you more about, about how to use certain things than I can. Um, but along the way, I've found that for being able to like automate, organize your business, especially with dance, what I think what's really powerful about Google is they also have YouTube. Um, and I think for many, many dancers um, and many dance companies, you know, YouTube is the, one of the original ways to, to broadcast um, your work and, you know, highlight things that um, that you put together. And I think it continues to be today, specifically for us, it's been the complete backbone of what we do, um, you know, that coupled with your Gmail, with your, um, you know, your G drive, your ability to share documents, to organize yourself, have it all in one place and how it all ties in together and then getting the analytics from that. I haven't found a better tool than, than just overall investing into Google and, and all the resources that it provides um, for a, you know, startup or a young business that is trying to, to uh, scale and grow. Um, so I would, you know, I would suggest that, again, you don't have to be a technical expert, but just exploring G Suite, if you're looking to try something, it might even tell you and give you the direction of how you can craft your business strategy and, and the direction you want to go just by seeing what the tools are. Usually you think it's the other way around. I got this strategy and I need the tools to get there. I think G Suite is so powerful sometimes. It tells you, wait, 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 I can do this? Oh, let me go in this direction, right? Um, especially when you start to figure out analytics a little bit more too. Um, so I, yeah, I would definitely highly recommend uh, using that tool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lavesh. Violetta, did, did you have any tools or resources that have been really important for you? And this can include technology, a particular mentor, a book, maybe that kind of really changed the way that you've looked at things for your business. Um, I actually, um, what was great now, the new board team that has helped me and then the Zoom meetings where we were able to connect with sponsors that are not available or able to just this so spread thin, you know, like for instance, Amazon, I would have never thought I would have an opportunity to work with Amazon. And now that I got to, you know, be introduced by, through my board, we were able to do Zoom. These type of, the technology is such the greatest thing now, again, I said overseas or cities where you can't meet with them face to face. This is a quick way that we can um, recommend others to deal business. I think this was this has been the best thing that I had. Um, doing videos and content that I was able to share um, that we also got Omarion involved just because of that. You know, Instagram just been the greatest tool of all. And during the pandemic where you was limited in doing stuff. So we would sneak out and do uh, creative work and present our choreography. And that was able to catch eyes to everyone else. So Instagram and now, of course, TikTok, whether explaining, you know, the hows, the do's and don'ts or being the greatest dancer or the culture of what you are teaching is a bigger platform that would help a lot of people to expand or, you know, be the voice of what they want to share and what they love doing in the arts. So that has helped. 
That's awesome. Thank you so much, Violeta. I wanted to make sure that the audience was aware that you can ask questions. We want, we have some amazing panelists here that are available to answer questions that you might have if you're interested in starting your own dance business. So please feel free to chime in and we'll be sure to address any questions that you might have. I wanted to move over to um, something that I know really helps me in, in running my business and, and all the plans that I have um, is having certain quotes that I, I pull that I always pull out of my back pocket or a word of advice that I can always speak to or a Bible verse or a saying or anything. What are some of you all's favorite things to always go back to when maybe you're having some trouble or you're feeling a little discouraged in some kind of way with your business and what keeps you going? And I will start with Violetta. Uh, my life, uh, my struggle. Uh, I'm from El Barrio. It was very tough and it's very hard. But seeing what I've gone through in my experience, being a single mom, being a Latina, um, not able to have, you know, being great in the dance world, but just seeing the stories of everyone else, the struggles, their, their experience, and now that I can relate and transfer and share with, just seeing that keeps me going. Uh, the need of our, our community, just being the voice, being consistent, um, and seeing that, you know, there's other platforms and friends and amazing people, again, that inspires me to keep going. You know, so that's where I go back to going back to rehearsal, seeing these dancers coming from all over, all ages, gathering, hungry, developing, learning, no matter where they come from, what age, what height, what culture they are, illness. You know, I'm like, you know, what more can you do to complain? This is a place where we can escape, feel free, claim and 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 not give up, you know, so around dumb is my reason not giving up because the struggle is everywhere like you know we could be great even a millionaire billionaire there's always going to be a problem we got to be ready for that we got to accept it what i got to do that's not going to work what can i do i see the problems within my company and that's how i continue to thank you so much violetta <laughs> Sorry, you guys, I live on a very busy street in bed <laughs> Um, Sorry about that. Um, yeah, one thing that really resonated with me with what you just said, Violetta, is, a, is something that I go back to and it's read your own story and just look back on your own life and look where you've come from. You know, you didn't come this far to come this far, right? So thank you so much for sharing that. Jeremy, do you have any anything that you kind of like always have that you can pull back and, and use? Yeah, there's a few things that have helped me. Um, one of the quotes that first comes to mind is nothing to prove, only to share. Um, especially in the dance industry, we often find ourselves comparing ourselves to other people and other people's success and whatnot. And, you know, it's, it's important to remember to stay in your own lane, that this, that this journey is your journey and, and your race to be uh, to be on um, and that it's it's going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a sprint. Good things take time, but you have to be willing to put in all of the time that's necessary to to build something that's truly going to be lasting. That was probably like four quotes. <laughs> but those are just some some tips and some keys and things that I have to remind myself constantly on a daily. Yeah, that's awesome, Jeremy. And, and, and that just reminded me of another thing that I incorporate into my daily life is meditation and mindfulness and taking time to just remind myself of certain things and to try to start the day off in a positive light because you never know what's going to happen. But if you at least start with a positive outlook, it can really change the way that things go about for the rest of the day. Like at the end of the day, we can't always control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond, our perspective on those things. So that's another quote that I always, I probably just said three quotes too, right? So, um, and these are things that we just have to remind ourselves. We have to be active in, in keeping ourselves going. So thank you all for that. Lavesh, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I don't know if this is Lavesh. I don't know if this is officially a quote, but um, do it because you love it. <laughs> I don't think that's very fancy, but it, it really means a lot to me because um, 
especially in this day and age, and I'm sure many of us as dancers can relate to this need to pump out content because you see it everywhere. And it's like, ah, I got to be famous on the gram and I got to be a TikToker and I have to do it because everyone else is doing it. And you get swallowed up in it. Well, not everyone wants to do that as a dancer. It's not, it's not a, you know, it's not something that we, you, we should be forced to feel how to do. Right. And um, so I think for me, when I'm looking at like content creation, as an example, I, I, over the years, I've, kind of conditioned myself and let some of that go and said, you know what, I'm only going to do something if I really am passionate about it because A, it'll come out better that way anyways. And B, that will give me the self-fulfillment and give me the joy of why I started and got into what I did anyways. Right. Um, And maybe that means I pass up on something that, you know, is a trend that will get a hundred K views and maybe my video only gets a few hundred views. That's okay because I did it because I like doing it. Right. And that's what I want to share. Um, so I think that's that's been a very important thing for me that I've learned uh, over time. And I still continue sometimes to have to tell myself, um, you know, with all the crazy trends going out there and how much social media has grown. Um, I think that has been a grounding uh, you know, factor for me and, and helps me continue doing what I do and loving what I do. And that's what keeps the passion going for me. Thank you so much for, uh, for that, Lavesh. I was going to it just reminded me of something else. Uh, when you're operating from a place of of passion as opposed to something else, it's more sustainable. You know, if it's something that's within you, that's in your heart, you can. It's always there. But if it's some outside force, someone telling you to do it, some outside pressure, eventually, it's not going to become as sustainable as if it was something that is really deeply rooted within you as an individual. So, thank you for that. Um, we have a few minutes and a, and a couple more questions. Uh, so I wanted to ask each of you, what legacy would you like to leave in, with your business? What do you see as your legacy for your business? And I'll, I'll ping this back over to Lavesh. Um, yeah, sure. Hey, this is Lavesh. So for me, I think going back to our roots and what we started with, which was to provide a way for people to learn this particular folk dance um, and for people who may have never heard of it before to first to be introduced to it. We, you know, our goal is always to provide it for free through, you know, YouTube and our app. Um, And at the end of the day, I think that's what we want to be known for is that gold standard that put out all of this information about uh, Bhangra and made it accessible to everyone that uh, our mission statement is bringing Bhangra to everyone. Right. So um, really with all the other things going on, like I kind of talked about a second ago, feeling like you have to create certain content and hitting on trends and saying, I'm going to go into X, Y, Z side. That's, you know, um, going to make me X amount or this amount. I think the passion of why I started what we, you know, what not just myself, my team, we started was to make this dance accessible to everyone. And in five years, I want to be remembered for the same thing that if I want to go learn Bhangra or, um, you know, if I, if it comes across, my desk and I've never heard about what Bangladesh is before. This is the brand that, that kind of got me and taught me about, um, you know, what it is. And then if somebody wants to interact further with us and continue, you know, joining our brand journey, great. If not, that's okay because we at least made that dance accessible to them and then they can find their own journey to, you know, kind of continue on and, and learn from a business standpoint, of course. Um, so yeah, I think that's where we would like our, our legacy to be. Thank you so much, so much. That's beautiful. Uh, Violetta, what would you like your legacy to be? Well, we've been constant, a reminder of, you know, to keep and pass the discipline, the responsibility um, to these dancers of homework, research, not only in just dance, but in business, in relationship, that every tool and formula that we share with them as an artist is something that they're gonna be shared in business or in their life, personal life. Um, that, you know, this is not uh, just a dance company. This is a family. This is a family where, you know, the support is not just through the dance. It doesn't matter if you're not amazing, if you're a professional, non-professional, we're as one. We accept any type of dancer. We don't audition. And we wanna keep that because we want we want people to feel 
not intimidated. We want people to feel accepted in what they think in whatever level they want to be in. And to pass that down, to keep that, the responsibility, the responsibility in that, um, and pass it down to our new generation. Cause as as years go, it waters down or it gets erased. And we don't want to lose that. We don't want to lose why we were passionate. We don't, we don't want to lose why we did what we did and why we continue to do what we do. So I try to remember the responsibilities and the pressure that I've dealt with or what it took for me to be where I'm at now without social media and continue to bring that in of what's the now because we can't lose the past. History is so important. So we try to keep that in, hoping that our new generation takes that all in and pass those tools with infrastructure, everything that they can do to now bring it and take it to the next level, but keeping the tools of responsibility and discipline with our with any company. But as for our company, yeah. Thank you so much, Violetta. Community is obviously very important to you and I, I commend you for that. Jeremy, what would you like your legacy to be? Such a loaded question. Um, I think one that inspired others to see the beauty of Black lives and and Black experiences and, and inspired them in a way to share their own stories through whatever artistic medium that speaks to them um, and an organization that helped champion um, true diversity in the arts, specifically in the ballet world, which has always seemed so um, exclusive and has shied away from sharing such diverse stories, not just Black stories, but even um, Indian stories or, or Latino Latinx stories um, through ballet. I, I hope that we can look back years from now and see that we were a catalyst for change. Amen. Amen, indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeremy. One last question for each of you, and this is like kind of like a quick one. Uh, one sentence, if you could leave us with one, with some parting words, like one sentence of just something to inspire or just parting words that you would like to leave with the audience, what would that be? And I'll hand it over to Violetta. Keep consistence, no matter what, and keep rising to the top, never stop. <laughs> Love that so much. Lavesh, what would be your parting words? Surround yourself with people smarter than you. Um, I, for me, that has been the biggest thing that has helped me grow. And, uh, and I felt, and I feel has also helped, um, my company grow is, is learning is, uh, you know, keeping your mind open and, and continuing to be inspired by others who are smarter than you in something, right? Because that for me, at least personally, keeps me motivated and wanting to grow and get better and keep doing what I'm doing. And I keep doing what I do. Um, and that community feel is uh, is really important too because I think having that support structure makes it a lot lot easier to to succeed when you have people you can trust and look up to. Absolutely, thank you, Lavesh. And Jeremy, what would be your parting words? Uh, mine is in the form of a short story, but essentially the the message is to make sure that you're taking time for yourself, to enjoy you, to appreciate you, and the things that you like. When I first moved to New York City, coming from San Diego, California, which is so laid back with great weather and sunshine and good food, um, I was completely overwhelmed by the amount of competition and the hustle and bustle and the fast paced movement of New York City. And um, I felt in a way that I, I lost a bit of myself trying to fit in, trying to um, achieve and, and always being so focused on trying to get that next gig or getting that next choreography gig or whatever it may be that I, I didn't take time for myself. And so uh, somehow in, in probably my junior year of college, um, luckily our, our school was right near Columbus Circle. So there was a Godiva chocolate store. And on Fridays, I had a break between my last uh, academic class and my last dance class. And somehow I would find myself in the Godiva chocolate store every Friday. 
and I would treat myself. I would buy a couple truffles. Uh, Godiva, as we know, is generally kind of expensive, especially on a college student budget, but I would often try to save at least five or six dollars so I could get a couple truffles that week. And um, it started to become a trend that my friends noticed. They would see me walking around with my little gold chocolate bag and I had my headphones on listening to my music, sitting in Central Park or whatever. But it was something that I did for myself every week, no matter what was going on, no matter what form of discouragement or frustration I had received that week, it was a moment for me to just kind of step back and just reflect and give thanks for even just having made it this far from having been that eight-year-old kid who dreamed of the days he would be performing on stages in New York City to then be in college and having not quite, you know, been on the stages yet, but even just moving to New York and being able to be in Central Park in itself is a, a huge blessing. And I think it's important that we should take time every week to enjoy and indulge in something that we love and, and as a way of giving thanks and just kind of um, honoring the space and time that we're in right now. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for that. Um, this, this has been an amazing panel and we really appreciate everyone for the insight and for sharing such personal stories with us about your journeys. We are extremely proud of every single one of you um, for the work that you're doing. We know that you're making such a huge difference in, in your respective communities, in the dance community as a whole. And I am going to turn it over to the host now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> I was so wrapped up in the conversation. Um, thank you, Violetta, Jeremy, Valdesh, and Ashley for this wonderful conversation, really insightful. Um, to our attendees, I hope you were able to take away some transformative ideas and considerations as well. Uh, I would like to um, say a final thank you to our sponsors, to Lachey Flowers from Viscardi Center and Lisa Reynolds and Alison Paduano from Sign Nexus for their invaluable support. So I would like to invite everybody to head over to the session follow-up chat in the community section if, you know, if they want to continue the conversation um, and, uh, um, and ask questions with the panelists. So um, before we close, I just want to do a quick reminder on what's on the agenda for the rest of the symposium today. Um, if you want to explore more concepts uh, within life cycles, livelihood and legacies, we have three more daytime sessions coming up, all held at 2.30. Before that, at this time, you can also uh, take your lunch or head over to our exhibitor hall for the virtual expo showcase. Um, we have one right now, and there's there's going to be another one at 5 p.m. as well later this, this later this afternoon. Um, don't forget that uh, you can create virtual meetups and online conversations at our community board as well. Tonight's program is um, should be an incredible uh, keynote conversation um, entitled "Disabled Artists and the History of Dance, Activism, and Collective Care." It's an address by Corvette O'Toole about the evolution of dance activism and an ethos of collective care in the United States. So the presentation um, will, will be followed by a response from the, with the Dance NYC uh, Disability Dance Artistry Residency Artists. So these are some of the artists who are involved in our program as well. So that should be a really uh, also a wonderful um, presentation and conversation. That's it. Enjoy the rest of your time at the symposium. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for joining today's session. A special thanks to our funders, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Howard Gilman Foundation, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, New York State Council on the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Arts. A special thanks to our lead corporate sponsor, 
Con Edison, and our lead dance advocate, Jody Gottfried Arnold. Subsidies for the Education and Dance Worker Ticketeers are made possible by the Arnold Foundation. A special thanks to our leader, host, and partner level sponsors, 92nd Street Y, Harkness Dance Center, Dance Education Library, Cataliodi Law, Full Out Creative, Gibney Dance Center, Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance, The Actors Fund, Ballet Hispanico, Fit for Dance, Nai Ni Chin Dance Company, NDI Collaborative for Teaching and Learning, New York Live Arts, and Tom O'Connor Consulting Group. And last, but certainly not least, a special thanks to our Justice, Equity, and Inclusion Partners, Art Beyond Sight, Art Space Sanctuary, Asian American Arts Alliance, Center for Traditional Music and Dance, the International Association of Blacks in Dance, Lotus Music and Dance, Museum Arts and Culture Access Consortium, National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, New York Foundation for the Arts, and Women of Color in the Arts. Up next, please feel free to rest, reflect, and eat a nourishing lunch. You may also check out our virtual expo in the Exhibitor Hall at this time. At 2.30, we begin our late afternoon sessions, and at 4.15, we gather in our daily debrief. At five o'clock, we revisit the exhibitor hall for more booth activity at our virtual expo showcase. And at six o'clock, we gather for our keynote presentation. Stay connected with us by posting your takeaways on social media using the hashtags DanceSimp, DanceNYC 2022, and DanceSimp 2022. On Instagram at dance.nyc, on Twitter, at dance.nyc and on Facebook at dance slash NYC. Some features not to miss. Build your agenda of sessions, connect with other attendees, join community conversations, visit the exhibitor hall. Don't forget to check out the 2022 Symposium Digital Program Book. How are we doing? Did you like a session? Use the like feature on your favorite session. Got feedback for us? Take the post-event survey after March 19th and tell us how we did. Need help? Email us at customerservice at dance.nyc. A special thanks to our broadcast streaming partners at Full Out Creative. Thanks for joining. Keep in touch at dance.nyc.